Hey there, attorney Lance Fryrear here with the law offices of Lance Fryrear. I'm putting on this uh, Facebook, putting on this uh, Facebook Live today to talk about uh, harassment in Washington State. So, what do I mean by harassment? Um, harassment. Uh, can be a criminal charge. And so you could be interested in this uh, talk if you're charged with the crime of harassment or um, harassment uh, can also be something, hey, your neighbors are bothering you and you want to get an unlawful uh, protection order from unlawful harassment. It's trying to say, hey, quit bothering me neighbors or quit bothering me someone else. So number one, I'm going to start with the criminal harassment. So in Washington State, there is a law called harassment. And if you want to look it up, it's RCW. I'm going to look at my screen here, 9A46020. But basically, it says if a defendant or a suspect threatens to harm someone or threatens to harm their property, um, you know, threatens to beat you up, threatens to harm your property, threatens to harm someone that you care about even, um, and the victim, the person hearing the threat, reasonably believe believes that the threat uh, may be carried out, that's a crime. Okay, so it can be two different levels of crime. The most standard crime uh, form is called uh, a gross misdemeanor. That means the maximum penalty of, uh, is $5,000 fine and one year in jail. And there's also a felony level. I call that magic words harassment. If you make a threat to kill, then that's a felony. If I say, hey, I'm gonna kill you, that's a felony. If the, the the person hearing the threat reasonably believes the threat would be carried out, and if I just say, "Hey, I'm going to beat you to within an inch of your life," well, that's not a felony. That's a gross misdemeanor. So, I've always found that interesting in the law. But uh, so there's a difference there. Um, for the charge of harassment, you can also have a felony charge if you've got a prior offense. Uh, prior offense against the same person. There's a list in the statute. I don't need to go into it here, but just realize that making threats against people, if it's a threat to harm them physically or harm their property, um, then that could be a criminal action. And so you want to be careful about that. Um, as far as uh, how we might typically defend uh, the charge of harassment, if we were dealing with that, is we might uh, defend by saying that the victim did not reasonably believe the threat would be carried out. Um, I've seen plenty of cases over the years where uh, maybe someone is suicidal and, and uh, you know, the, the victim's trying to help the person who is suicidal. And then the person who is suicidal says, hey, you know, leave me alone or I'm going to kill you. Right. So um, in that situation, the person supposedly being threatened doesn't go running out the room. They still try to help. And so occasionally the police get called there and maybe they arrest the suicidal person for felony harassment because that was a threat to kill. But the, probably the main reason they're making the arrest is to help that situation and help the person. But so we can look at what the actions were of the uh, person supposedly being threatened to see if the actions they took after the threat is consistent with them being reasonably afraid the threat would be carried out or not. Did they go running off or did they, you know, get more aggressive towards the suspect? So that's uh, something that we want to think about. As far as if you're more interested in, um, you know, the neighbor type situation or someone's calling you if you're not talking about criminal harassment, if we're talking about, hey, I'm being harassed and I want to do something about it, then the law also provides for uh, you to petition a court in the jurisdiction, either where you live or the person harassing you lives for what's called a protection order. You know, out there in the public, we call it, you know, lots of people call it restraining orders if you're going to type it into Google. Um, but in Washington state, there's something called an order for protection from unlawful harassment. And this is a very wide uh, range of situations that statute can apply for. And so the difference between criminal harassment and trying to get an anti-harassment order is in a criminal harassment case, it's the police or the government that's uh, you know filing a cause of action or prosecuting uh, the suspect, the person making a threat. In a uh, civil case, and if you're filing for a protection order, it doesn't involve the government. It involves a petitioner, the person making the complaint, and a respondent, the person that the petitioner 
is complaining about, saying, hey, the response, the respondent's bothering me. They're contacting me at all hours of the night. They're texting me. They won't leave me alone. They're showing up at my house. They're maybe actually threatening me also, because it could be a crime and also actionable. Um, and so if that's the situation you're in and you're trying to uh, deal with the situation with a neighbor or with a ex or a coworker or just a stranger who's bothering you, one of the key things the court looks at is they look at um, basically what notice did you provide to the respondent that no future conduct or, or contact was wanted. And so that's one of the key things the court looks at. Um, the court will also look at, hey, is the contact from the respondent towards you, is it for a legitimate or lawful purpose? Or is it, there's there no legitimate or lawful purpose? In other words, if you keep getting contacted by a debt collector because you owe $200 to a company. Well, you probably can't file something about unlawful harassment because they have a legitimate and lawful purpose for trying to contact you. Now, let's say that your ex-boyfriend will not quit texting you and will not quit calling you or, or, is, or is following you around. Well, um, while they might have a reason in their mind to do that, that probably is a good argument. That's not a legitimate or lawful purpose. That's just you know, creepy, I guess, in this case, right? Um, so... The court's going to look at that. So if you're trying to build an anti-harassment case against somebody, it's pretty important to put them on notice and be able to prove it. You could have an attorney write a letter, um, cease and desist. You could, you know, send them a text message saying, don't con contact me ever again. Um, those are things that you want to uh, look at. You also want to be careful if you're trying to build that case that you don't initiate contact yourself because in determining whether or not um, the contact between the parties serves legitimate or lawful purpose. The court is instructed to look at, you know, did the petitioner also invite the contact or initiate contact? I mean, what were the messages going back and forth? Did you want to talk to the person one day and not another? Um, they'll also look at uh, how many contacts there have been. There has to be a course of conduct, no matter how short, evidencing a continuity of purpose. Now, that's a mouthful, but you know, a certain purpose on behalf of the respondent. The purpose on the respondent has to be not legitimate. And also it has to basically cause the petitioner, you know, emotional distress, you know, and reasonable emotional distress. You know, if it wouldn't be reasonable to say, hey, every time the UPS guy comes to my door to leave me a package, I'm really upset. So I want an order against him. That would, that's an extreme example, but that would be if that you were really upset when the, when the UPS guy showed up. Um, the court would think, well, that's not reasonable to be upset. And so there's lots of arguments to be made on both sides. But if you have that problem, you need to try to build your case. And then you need to file uh, a petition in the court, typically a district court or, or uh, is where you would file that. Uh, and they have forms at the court and forms online you can get, you know, saying why you want this order against the respondent, making them leave you alone. And then you'll usually, the judge will review that, and then they might issue you a temporary protection order. If they issue you a temporary protection order, then the respondent has to be served, and um, then there's a they get to go to court two weeks later on average and then argue about whether or not they're harassing you. And so I know that's a lot of detail, but if you're interested in that, we have a website with an ebook. Uh, you can go to restrainingorderplaybook.com. Um, restrainingorderplaybook.com, and you can download our ebook about how to deal with uh, how to either respond to orders or, or you know, the process for getting an order. Um, if you're a respondent, if you're served with a protection order um, for unlawful harassment, then uh, you want to avoid certain mistakes. You don't just want to show up at the court date and think you can tell your story. And while it's nice to think that, uh, usually the court doesn't have time to hear everything from scratch at the court hearing that you're going to go to. So typically speaking, you're going to need to file a written response with the court. And we've got some videos on our YouTube channel. You can check out our YouTube channel. Uh, we're at uh, uh, thelancelawyers.com uh, is what you need to search through YouTube. Um, and uh, we've got videos on that. But basically, don't make the mistake of simply uh, thinking you can show up in court and say, hey, I've not been harassing this person. Well, that's, it's, it's nice to think of it that way. Uh, the court doesn't really have time, and they, they're already going to have read the written claims by the petitioner. 
If they've not read your response by the time they start the hearing, now the deck is even the deck is even more stacked against you than um, it would be otherwise because you know these things are hard to win. So what's the effect if you get a restraining order against somebody or there's one against you? Well, typically a restraining order is going to order the respondent to not have any contact with the petitioner, to not go to the petitioner's home or workplace or school, um, to not have third party contact and not text and not email. And if any of those things happen, then that's a crime. And so while getting a protection order is not criminal, violation of a protection order is criminal and will lead to arrest and a big problem. So you need to take it seriously. Um, both sides do, but especially if you're a respondent, don't think, well, I don't care if I ever see that person again, so I'm just going to give them an order. You know, check with an attorney first. You can call our office. You can call another office. Uh, there's lots of attorneys that do this type of stuff um, and uh, see what they think you should do. Um, you know, finally, if I go back to, uh, again, if you're more interested in the criminal side, you know, how is it that that uh, you initiate a criminal charge against somebody, if that's what you're looking to do, well, then you'd contact the police. Hey, police, this person's been harassing me, making these threats. Here's the text messages with the threats, or here's what they said. And if you're trying to defend a harassment case, um, obviously you're going to need an attorney because these are crimes where you can go to jail. Um, and the good news is those are things that attorneys can have you do. Uh, we can, of course, look at the evidence to try to show that you didn't make the threat or there was no reasonable belief the threat would be carried out. And if that's a little bit weaker, you were mad and maybe said something wrong, well, maybe we can do some educational classes. Maybe we can have you do an anger management class. Maybe we can have you do some counseling. Maybe you can make the most out of the crisis, not only help the case, but help yourself. Because if you're in that situation, there's probably a big conflict that was going on. And, uh, you know, we could probably, you know, learn something uh, from what happened while trying to, uh, to help the situation. So I, I hope, uh, you know, this has been useful. Um, again, uh, feel free to check out our, our YouTube uh, station. We have plenty of videos on that. You can just search my name or our law office's name on YouTube and come up with our channel. Um, I, I'll try to see if we can link to it here as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, we got Instagram too, but, uh, that's just pretty to look at. Right. So, um, so if you have a problem, give us a call, uh, you know, we'll do whatever we can and, uh, we'll be there for you. Thank you.